Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth session of the BRIC Summer Engagement Series. My name is Camille Crane, and I'm the BRIC Section Chief at FEMA Headquarters, and I'm so glad you were able to join us today. This is our four part, fourth session out of five, where we're joining you every Wednesday in the month of July to talk about the new grant program, BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. So last week, we discussed building codes and why building codes are fundamental to community resiliency. Today, we're going to focus on another priority of BRIC, FEMA's community lifelines. We will define what community lifelines are and why they're important for resilience, discuss how lifelines and mitigation fit together, identify how BRIC can be used to protect lifelines, and provide examples on how critical services have been protected by mitigation projects. Before we get started, I have a couple of logistics. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on FEMA's YouTube channel and on the BRIC webpage in the next few weeks. You'll also find in the file download pod the copy of today's session or the PowerPoint and as well the infographic, which is a flyer about the BRIC program. I'm so happy that today we have a couple of great speakers joining me. First, we're going to have Kaya Lakia, the Director of Hazard Mitigation Division, get us started introducing us to Lifeline, as well as Ben Cabana of FEMA's Office of Policy and Performance, which will, who will discuss defining community lifelines. After that, I'll come back on and discuss where lifelines fit into BRIC. And so with that, Kayed, I'd like to turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Camille. Um, thank you and welcome to session four of the BRIC Summer Engagement Series. Um, as Camille said, my name is Kayed Lakia, and I'm the Director of Hazard Mitigation at FEMA. As the head of the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Division, HMA, I oversee efforts to reduce nationwide vulnerability to disasters and natural hazards by increasing community resilience through efficient and effective hazard mitigation grant programs and resources. Within the HMA division, we have five grant programs to provide mitigation funding. The Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, the HMGP, the Hazard Mitigation Post-Fire Grant Program, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Grant Program, FMA, and the PDM Program, the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant Program. Now we have the new BRIC program. For those of you who may not have been able to join previous sessions, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC, replaces the existing PDM program. The 2018 DRRA, Disaster Reform Recovery Act, authorizes FEMA to create BRIC and support greater investments in mitigation planning and projects before a disaster. BRIC will allow for a more reliable funding stream to enable more robust project development. All of the funding opportunities that HMA oversees are helping to build a more resilient nation under FEMA's strategic plan, which aims to create a shared vision for the field of emergency management and sets an ambitious path forward to unify and further professionalize emergency management across the country. The BRIC program in particular will help to better position HMA to build a culture of preparedness, ready the nation for catastrophic disasters, and reduce the complexity of FEMA, all of which are key goals within the agency's strategic plan. BRIC's six guiding principles, which are the foundation of the program, include support community capability and capacity building, encourage and enable innovation, promote partnerships, enable large infrastructure projects, maintain flexibility, and finally, provide consistency. Today's session will focus on the importance of community lifelines in the context of resilience and the BRIC program. Lifelines provide indispensable services to communities and enable continuous operation of critical government functions and businesses essential to human health, safety, and economic security before, during, and after a disaster. One of the key elements of BRIC is the support of projects that mitigate risk across lifelines. Community lifelines are vital because they enable the continuous operation of critical government and business functions and are essential to human health and safety or economic security. As such, lifelines are the most fundamental services in the community 
that when stabilized, enable all other aspects of society to function. FEMA developed the community life science concept to support response planning and operations. And the concept can be applied across the entire preparedness cycle. Efforts to protect lifelines, prevent and mitigate potential impacts to them, and build back stronger and smarter during recovery will drive overall resilience of our nation. The National Response Framework is a national initiative which supports FEMA's Community Lifelines Initiative. The National Response Framework is a guide to how the nation responds to all types of disasters and emergencies. It is built on scalable, flexible, and adaptable concepts identified in the National Incident Management System to align key roles and responsibilities across the nation. This session is divided into two parts. The first part of today's session will focus on the history and relevance of FEMA's community lifelines. The second, today, second part of today's session will focus on how community lifelines fit into FEMA's new BRIC program. Our next speaker, Ben Cabana, has extensive experience talking about FEMA's community lifelines. Um, ben is the senior policy advisor, both within FEMA's uh, response directorate. And with that, I will turn it over to Ben to go over community lifelines in more detail. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Kayed. Today, we're going to identify how FEMA is defining community lifelines. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate having the opportunity to, to brief this community. Uh, it's really exciting thinking you know, three years ago, the idea, the concept of community lifelines wasn't even an idea on a bar napkin. And here we are three years later, it's not only official policy within the response mission area, and we're now seeing it uh, being embraced and, and um, integrated across all the different mission areas. So it's really exciting for us to see the progression. Uh, First, I just wanted to lead off in how the lifelines are really why they, they came to be, what gap they were filling within our current uh, policies and, and frameworks. Thinking through the response mission area, we already have core capabilities. We already have the emergency support functions. Why this extra thing called community lifeline? And really, the, the reason was thinking through the emergency support functions as the way we, we bundle our response capabilities of different organizations together, the core capabilities, the, the actual response actions that are, that are generally required during an incident, there was no framework, no lens through which to assess the community itself, the stability of that community during response. And so the lifelines are designed to be the, the independent assessment of how the, the condition of the of the community is for us to be able to help to identify and rapidly determine what response requirements are needed in the initial response phase of an incident, and to be able to understand interdependencies across the various services that are so in interdependent uh, within each of the lifelines in our infrastructure sectors. Thinking through operational reporting, we used to always report on the ESS, uh, and so ESF 12 energy, Within that area, we report on power outages and power restoration plans. But we never told the story by looking through lifelines and deconstructing the emergency support functions from the conditions in the community, we are able to break down silos between the emergency support functions during reporting. Think, for example, if ESF2, um, if we're reporting that there are cellular towers out in an impacted area, looking to try to identify the root cause of that might not actually lead us to an ESF2 function or solution. If there's road access issues to that cell tower, it doesn't matter if we have restoration crews in the area, if they can't get there, the priority or really the first step in the solution set is to get the roads cleared through ESF1. Um, so, you know, that was one of the major benefits is to allow us to, to assess the community itself, to break down the silos between the ESFs to say, the ESFs are the problem solvers, but truly the lifelines are the, the, the most important aspects of a community that we need to apply all of our response capabilities to, to try to stabilize rapidly. The other really big advantage of the lifelines construct is that it's plain language. Um, going into a response, we're dealing with 
people ranging from elected officials to emergency managers to uh, law enforcement, fire, military, NGOs, the private sector, everyone has their own vernacular and their own language. This is an extremely simple, plain language way to articulate what the impacts are and what your response requirements can be that everyone embraces this and can, can easily communicate this way. It facilitates information sharing and reporting across our spectrum of partners up and down the, uh, the emergency management um, levels as well as trying to turn operational reporting into effective public messaging as well. So how did we get to this point? That was the, the requirement. Really, 2017, the hurricane season, was the, the start of this. There, there, there was no such thing as lifelines as I mentioned in the 2017 hurricane season. And think about balancing concurrent incidents in, uh, in Texas from Hurricane Harvey in the Virgin Islands in Florida for Hurricane Irma, and then another hurricane strike in the Caribbean for Maria, and we are balancing limited response capabilities across a significant area of operation. Coupling on top of that, wildfires that started on the West Coast, we, you know, it was, it was extremely difficult to be able to assess where we were in each one of those incidents and determine how we could best allocate limited resources across all those areas. So one of the major findings of the 2017 hurricane season is we have to come up with some, some lens through which to look at an incident, to look at a community following an incident, and assess how far we are progressing in the response phase towards stabilization, that is, towards alleviating those immediate need, uh, threats to life and property, and being able to turn the corner and start the work of recovery. That was a call from the after action report from 2017 is to, is to create a new operational prioritization and response tool. That was the birth of the community lifeline construct. Throughout 2018, we started developing, throwing around ideas on, on exactly what this was going to look like. It, it, it was not perfect, of course, um, but fortunately we had the opportunity to, uh, to really work and get, get engagement with our, with our region, state and regional partners to, to help us get some, some insight from their perspective and, and make it a, a pretty good first draft of, the, of a construct to assess the community stability. Um, by the time the 2018 hurricane season rolled around, the, the construct was still in its infancy, but mature enough that it was ready for its initial roll out it, if you will, to, to try to, to utilize it during response operations. So during Hurricanes Florence and Michael and uh, typhoons in the Pacific, we were able to utilize the lifelines for operational reporting specifically uh, to be able to try to, to paint a, an effective picture on what was going on in those areas and what were the most critical impacts and threats that, that existed. Uh, in, in the days and, and weeks following each of those incidents. Following that, we learned a lot of good information, lessons learned from each of those incidents, the, the experiences, the feedback that we received from our regions, from the states and territories that, that we were supporting. Uh, it was generally positive uh, that, that this is an effective, easy to use means to communicate what those impacts are and to understand what, re what requirements are, are needed to stabilize an incident. But it wasn't perfect. And, and we had a lot of work to do. We knew to, to, um, to make some changes to mature the construct. So we took that feedback. We, we made modifications to it. And in early 20, 2019, uh, the first version of the Community Lifelines Toolkit was released. This was really the first formal guidance that was put out to the, to the country. Uh, on what the lifelines were and how they could be used during response operations. Later that year, uh, the Shake and Fury full-scale exercise was an opportunity for us to exercise in a no-fault environment, the, the construct for a large-scale earthquake uh, on the New, New Madrid fault line. And it also provided us you know, one last opportunity to take, to take feedback and, and experience before we finalized and rolled out the next version of the 
a toolkit for, uh, for the 2019 hurricane season. We also, in the, at the same time, in the spring and summer of 2019, were uh, sending both the National Response Framework, fourth edition, for concurrence through the whole community, as well as our interagency partners, um, and, and continued to modify through the feedback we received through those concurrence processes. And after, uh, in, in late 2019, it was October 2019, the National Response Framework was formally released, which introduced the community lifelines in national uh, response policy for the first time. So with, with the release of that, the NRS, the, the lifelines are now uh, formally recognized uh, PPD-8 construct under the National Preparedness Goal, like the core capabilities, like the emergency support functions. Um, in the toolkit, a second version of the toolkit was released in support of the NRF about a month later, as well as in a FEMA incident stabilization guide, which went into a little bit more detail internal to the agency on how we were going to be using the Lifelines construct to drive response operations and um, you know, the rapid stabilization of an incident and a transition to, to recovery. That's enough about the, the history of, of how we got there. Um, the last thing I do want to cover is the, the second version of the toolkit. I mentioned how it, um, you know, we continued to get this feedback. We had lessons learned from rolling this out in operations. The, the changes that you may have seen if you saw version one of the toolkit and version two of the toolkit the components and subcomponents that make up each of the lifelines were significantly refined. Um, the big theme of those changes were lifelines have to resonate for the, um, they, they exist steady state. They provide a service within a community. They're not things that are done after an incident act, response action. It is the provision of power in a community, the availability of communications, the availability of food, water, and shelter in a community. That, that is something that's important. Range 65 days a year. It's not. It's not just following an incident. Uh, there are normal service providers of the of those lifeline services. Um, during a response, we may need to provide those services in a, a different means while the normal service providers are unavailable. Um, but so the the major theme was that the the components and subcomponents are the service provided and the thing that normally provides them which allows us to assess impacts and their unavailability and organize our response actions to fill those gaps. How that's important for this audience is that prior, there were things like a component and subcomponent of the energy lifeline was temporary emergency power. And that's not really a, a, a lifeline day to day throughout a community that provide an essential service. Power is the essential service when it's not available, we can go in with a temporary emergency power mission to to re-energize critical facilities until we get the grid back up. Um, so you'll see the, the components and subcomponents are now the, the provision of service in, the, in a community that if the mitigation world is looking at using the lifelines, this, this allows them steady state to assess the vulnerability that's uh, of each of the lifeline providers in the community and determine what risks based on the ha hazards that a community will face and what we can potentially do to, to reduce the likelihood of failures of those lifeline services. The other major change in the, the later version of the toolkit is that we developed stabilization targets for each of the lifelines. Um, that's basically from a planning perspective what the policy level stabilization targets to say, what do we mean by stable in the food, water, shelter lifeline? Well, we mean that food, water, and shelter are available for survivors. So for every community, that's going to be a little bit different and exactly what that means. But we wanted to set some expectation about stable, stabilized following an incident isn't necessarily back to normal. There are, there are significant options to stabilize an incident and alleviate immediate threats to life and property without getting the getting full functionality of a, of a community back up and running. Um, 
temporary shelter, uh, temporary feeding solutions are going to alleviate an immediate threat to the population. It's not good, it's not perfect, but it is the initial objective of response is to alleviate that, that initial the initial requirement. And then we continue to, to work to improve standards of care. Get people out of congregate situations get um, you know, temporary feeding operations stood down as more and more of the normal services where they come back come back to life. Uh, the, and then finally, the last of the major changes, uh, the first version of the toolkit was really focused on operational reporting exclusively. Um, and we expanded it to really explain how to how we utilize the lifelines as really the lens through all of our response level planning content, whether it be deliberate operational planning for various scenarios or through crisis action planning from strategic planning for an incident all the way down to the incident action plan and in, uh, in identifying tasks and objectives for that particular operational period. So it really does tie in and, and, and make that make the lifeline kind of the, the bedrock, the lens that we're looking through all response uh, requirements, not just um, for operational reporting, but for, for planning as well. So it was a significant expansion in the in the role of the lifeline. That's enough of the history, but uh, in general, the lifeline, the, the formal definition is uh, a lifeline enables the continuous operation of critical government and business functions and is essential to human health and safety or economic security. Basically, the lifelines are the most important services in a community. They enable everything else in a community. When they are unavailable in a community, there's significant threat to, to life and property or for the survivors in that, in that area. And that's why they are the primary objective. The stabilization of these lifelines is the primary objective during response because everything else is going to, to rely on, on these basic seven services in order to get back up and running. So if we can get either temporary or, or permanent fixes to, to ensure that these, these lifelines are back up and running following an incident, we've, we've met the objective of response. We've enabled the, the longer-term recovery objectives to, to start to begin. Um, the, in general, the, these, these lifelines are provided by, by normal infrastructure owners and operators, ser government services within a community, private sector services within a community. Um, but when they are disrupted during, during an incident, significant decisive intervention is required to, to reestablish them. You know, 90 percent of the time, the, the normal services are going to come back within the, the first 12, 24 hours. But in a large-scale incident, you have to be prepared for the, the normal provider of these services to be unavailable for an extended period of time, and then be prepared to fill the gaps with contingency solutions in the meantime. So examples I use for food, water, and shelter were congregate sheltering, uh, congregate feeding from a health and medical standpoint, if there's significant uh, impacts to the hospitals in an area, deploy a federal medical station to, to provide medical care in a community while the, the hospital is not functioning. Uh, you can go down the list and, and, and go through some of the, the contingency solutions we can do to, to, to stabilize and provide that base level of, of service within a community to alleviate that threat. Um, while we're continuing to work through the longer uh, short-term recovery objectives to get the, the normal uh, owners and operators back up and running. And that's really the, the critical piece of, of, of this for us is um, from a, when we say in response to stabilization of these lifelines by any means necessary, getting the service back to the community. I think as we start talking at the end of the presentation about the application beyond just the response mission area into mitigation and, and other mission areas, you would can expand that that lens and look at the vulnerability of the service provider itself in any state and find out uh, what we can do to invest and potentially ensure that the, the impacts from, from an incident in the future will not be as severe, will not cause a significant outage next time.
So the lifeline being incorporated uh, does not does not remove the response core capabilities, does not remove the ESS. If you look at the national response framework, they're still all included within within the document. The, as I mentioned in the first slide, lifelines really filled a significant gap we perceived within the within the construct because there was no there was no way to, to assess the community itself. No way to assess uh, how those those critical services in the community, whether they were available for the survivors, whether there is a significant uh, threat to life and property. You know, people who have been doing this for a long time, they know it when they see it, but there was never a way to say these these seven things. Uh, pretty sure that if if you have these, the, the there is no immediate threat to life and property in the area. And so they the lifelines really do. Uh, work well with the ESFs and the core capabilities. ESFs and other core cap uh, and other organizing bodies, they, there are ways to organize departments, agencies, organizations to deliver like response capabilities. We, we organize our response activities by the emergency support functions. The response core capabilities are, from a preparedness standpoint, the the things we need to be prepared to do uh, to stabilize an incident. So the ESFs deliver the response core capabilities, if you will. But it was always to do what? Uh, it was always the, in, in response, the objective was to stabilize an incident. But what, what does stabilize, stabilize an incident mean? It means stabilize these seven lifelines. The, light, the stabilization of the lifelines at the ends, so you can look at this as a, a means, ways, and ends. ESFs are the means to, to deliver the core capabilities. The only reason we deliver the response core capabilities is to achieve the stabilization of the community lifelines. So looking through the lifelines, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through each of them one at a time, but each lifeline gets broken out into components and subcomponents. And the easiest way to understand this breakout is really just to, it, it helps define the parameters. What are what are the different services that that make up that component? What are the the different components that make up that lifeline? It allows us to define the the, the services, the, the capabilities that are that are required um, to help to provide that particular lifeline service. The next slide goes into is showing you the component level. Um, break out of each of the lifelines. And we didn't include it in this slide deck, but if you go to schema.gov slash lifelines, there are slides available for each of the components and subcomponents. So if you wonder what makes up each of the components and some component or what, what subcomponents and components make up a lifeline, um, that it's available for you on the community lifelines toolkit at schema.gov slash lifelines. Just really quick going through the component level, if we're assessing safety and security, we're looking at things like the ability to provide law enforcement and, and ensure law and order within a, within a community, the ability to provide fire services and fire suppression for any, uh, any required fire, uh, fire threats that exist in the community, the availability to meet any search and rescue requirements, critical government services, that exists within within the community and provide provide general services, whether that be um, you know executive leadership or schools, uh, all of those things would, would roll to the government services and then community safety, which is just those general general threats to community, whether they be um, water control facilities, things like that that uh, are necessary to, to to protect the community. Food, water, shelter. Um, critical food is the first component, obviously, whether it be uh, the general provision of food in grocery stores, restaurants. Um, during an incident, we would report our ability to meet a gap in food shortage or within, by doing uh, bulk distribution of, of, of meals. Water would include water infrastructure, drinking water infrastructure and wastewater infrastructure. Shelter would be the ability to, to house survivors or to house the population, whether that be in any state, homes, apartment, um, 
or or during the during the student uh, congress sheltering, and then agriculture impacts to animal and plant agriculture. Health and medical broken down into components of medical care, which ranges from hospitals to long-term care facilities, patient movement, uh, emergency medical services, general public health, uh, public health surveillance, uh, things, things of that and the like, fatality management, and the medical supply chain, is the ability to assess the ability to, to receive uh, both durable medical goods and pharmaceuticals that may be necessary to, to ensure the provision of medical care. Uh, energy lifeline is two components, power uh, and fuel. And just for an example, power is a subcomponent under power are generation, transmission, and distribution systems. Familiar to those familiar with the energy grid and the way it works, uh, but that's the way that, that the components get broken down into the subcomponents as well. Communications uh, infrastructure would range from, from cellular communications, the public public switch telephone network, broadcast radio, cable and internet. Alerts, warning, and messaging is the ability to, to issue alerts and warnings to the, to the public, issue effective public messaging, and being able to reach the survivors. 911 and dispatch is the ability to, to be able to call 911 and ensure your call is received and, and then dispatching the, the required assistance. Responder communications, ranging from land land mobile radio networks and other means that first responders communicate with one another. And finance, the ability to be able to access uh, electronic payment, um, you know, general banking services, ATMs, access to cash, things of that nature. The transportation lifeline, just, just the, the modes of transportation, uh, highway, roadway, uh, mass transit, rail, aviation, and maritime. And the last lifeline, Hazardous material, really hazardous material control. Uh, first component facilities, places where hazardous materials are stored, manufactured, uh, are supposed to reside, and ensuring that those are not compromised, that they are secure, and and the contents of those facilities are are safe. And then release of hazmat, um, the ability to to control, contain, and clean up the any any hazardous material releases. That's the general breakout of the lifelines. Again, FEMA.gov slash lifeline goes into the subcomponent level breakout of each of the lifelines to explain how we kind of define the critical services and make up each of the components. For our implementation, at least for the for the response mission area, um, from an operational reporting standpoint, all of our our operations reports are, are reported through this lens of lifelines. Whether it's our our ICS 209 situation reports at the field level or senior leadership briefings during an incident to say what the impacts of that particular incident were, we report that through the lens of lifelines. Our daily operations briefs uh, are are reported as you know, potential or actual impacts across the country based on ongoing or emerging threats and hazards. And then uh, as, as new incidents emerge, our spot reports are all, you know, all of, I guess the, the important thing there is all of our operational reporting is done through this lens of lifelines. What, what are the threats to, what are the impacts to the lifelines? What are we doing to stabilize them if there are significant impacts? From a planning perspective, not just our crisis action planning, everything from the, our incident approach, which is kind of our strategic plan to response, all the way down to the incident action plan and the tasks and objectives for a particular operational period. All of that is done by these actions tied to the reason why we're taking this action is to stabilize this or these lifelines. From a deliberate planning standpoint, all of our all hazards plans and, and deliberate plans for a particular incident are now being being written um, by articulating what that particular hazard is going to have impacts for each of the lifelines. So these are the new lens that we're that we're creating and developing these plans against the impacts to the to the, you know to the seven lifelines based on a hurricane scenario in this region is going to be this and 
here's what we're going to have to do to, to rapidly stabilize them for 72 hours. Uh, it's, the, it's the lens that we're, we're looking through all of our response planning and operations. But that said, there, there's certainly a broader application of the community lifeline across, across the mission area. Toolkit 2.0 is focused heavily on the response mission area. You really haven't fully engraved in our response operations and activities, but there's certainly an application across the other program areas as well. Looking from the efforts that the in preparedness of the threat and hazard ident identification risk assessment, the PIRA process has now included lifelines. In your community, what the, the biggest hazards and threats that you face what do you think the impacts to, to these lifelines are going to be? And what capability do you have, both organically or through mutual aid, to be able to, to stabilize or, or provide the services necessary to, to, re, to respond and recover from, from those incidents? It is now ingrained in the entire process to utilize the lifelines to be able to assess and, and develop the capability targets. From a protection standpoint, these are critical services, the infrastructure that provides these services is, is critical. And to be able to, to focus security and other protection capabilities to ensure that, that the, these services remain available and do not fail is, is critical. And so we're looking to our protection partners to be able to look to, to ensure the, the security of the, the lifelines and look at prioritizing security efforts towards the lifelines as well. From a recovery standpoint, it's really the you know, the, the most logical from, from the following response is our objective is to stabilize the lifeline. So it's not the end of the day. That's not that does not does not mean that our objectives are complete or that we that we are done or be able to transition. Um, there stable isn't necessarily good. There's a whole lot of stuff that can be done to ensure that that when we start rebuilding these lifelines following an incident, that we ensure to build them up, build them back stronger and better, to so that we are we are not in the same situation the next time we, we face the same incident. So we really are trying to partner with recovery to transition from stabilization of lifelines to. Uh, you know, longer-term objectives through the recovery outcomes of, of more resilient lifelines, which pivots back to mitigation, which is really the linchpin of all of it. How do we reduce lifeline vulnerability for the next incident? Um, you know, we hope to be able to incorporate formally the lifelines within each of the missionaries, and that's why I'm so excited to be able to have the opportunity to talk to you all about, about this and excited the direction the BRIC program is taking, because Lifelines exist steady state, and they enable all other aspects of society. When they fail, our job is to get them back up and running to alleviate those immediate threats to life and property. But there are other, there are significant opportunities for us to be able to, as a nation, look at the vulnerability of the lifeline steady state, look at the, the threats and hazards that we face, and invest steady state in ways to, to draw down risk to, to each of the lifelines and reduce the likelihood that they're going to fail. If, if successful in mitigation, we don't need to respond. And my feelings won't be hurt if we're, we're worked out of a job. We don't have to, to respond as, as frequently to the same types of incidents. Um, I think looking at the lifelines as the steady state means to assess the vulnerability of the community and, and prioritize investments in mitigation um, is going to go a long way in building the resilience of the, of the country. I'm really looking forward to, to seeing this construct mature across the emergency management community. Uh, that said, I think you've heard enough from me, so I'll turn things over to, to Camille Crane, who will tell us where Lifelines fit into BRIC. Thank you so much, Ben, for that great lead-in um, about the where BRIC or where Lifelines started, where they came from, and great tie-in into how they fit into mitigation and the BRIC program. So as you just heard, a community lifeline provides indispensable services that enable the continuous operation of critical business and, and government functions, and is essential to human safety, health, and economic security. When lifelines are disrupted, impacts 
cascade down. And so the goals and objectives of FEMA's strategic plan promote using mitigation to help reduce, reduce the risk to these lifelines before a disaster um, to quickly stabilize the community after a disaster to prevent these cascading impacts. By fostering mitigation best practices, BRIC will reduce and be responsive to stakeholder needs in the following ways. One, we're looking to leverage traditional and innovative engineering projects to improve the physical infrastructure, including roads, utilities, water systems, and electrical grids. We want to develop projects that emphasize community lifelines that are vital to community recovery and grounded in comprehensive approaches to, to planning. One thing I can say is lifelines, even though the construct has only been around since 2017, they're not new to the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program. HMA has a long history of mitigating risk to lifelines to learn from. We estimate that the HMA programs have contributed billions of dollars over our 30-year history to provide community funding for critical services and to make um, infrastructure more resilient. So just to show you that, we did, before we started looking at how lifelines might play a role in um, the BRIC program, we did an assessment across the five programs, or all the programs that Kai Ed mentioned in the beginning, to see how could we take project types that we had funded in the past and put them in, which lifelines did they help mitigate? And so as you can tell, as of data produced last week, um, we can attribute that we've obligated over $16 billion in HMA funding um, across our other, uh, our other four programs, which includes support across all the lifeline categories. Um, and so you can read the, the numbers there, four of them showing over a billion dollars in mitigation that's gone in to service one of those lifelines. So you've heard me talk, if you've listened to any of our other presentations, about the mitigation action portfolio or, the, or map. So a piece of the map, um, and just to give you a little refresher if you haven't heard about it before, the mitigation action portfolio came from our stakeholder comments. So when we did that large stakeholder engagement for the, before we built the BRIC program in the summer of 2019, a lot of what we heard back is, can you tell us more about what a BRIC project might look like? Um, so we've created a document that is going through its final review right now, um, final concurrence process, so we're hopeful to have it out very soon, um, that is a case study. And it's meant to be a living document that we will edit and add to over time. But it is um, a case study right now of about 40-something projects that look at multi-hazard multi um, different sizes from small to large and across the country. So we have projects from all corners of the United States. Um, and one of the pieces, as we give basically two page snapshots of each project and talk about what it is, what were the partnerships, what are the benefits, how much did it cost, has a little section where you can learn more talks about what hazards it mitigates. It also talks about what lifelines it mitigates. Um, and it will talk about both the primary lifeline and the um, secondary or alternate lifelines, because we really like projects that, that mitigate multiple lifelines. So what I'm going to go through is seven of the examples from the map. So we've pulled out seven different case studies. Um, that mitigates the different lifelines. And I'm going to walk through each of those. I've got my notes here so I can make sure that I give all the good details of those projects. So with that, let's get started. So the first one we're going to start with is um, you can see at the top there, there's a primary lifeline and then there's alternate lifelines or other lifelines as well. So this is a stormwater management project coming out of Houston, Texas. Um, as a former Texan, I can say, Houston, Texas has experienced significant flooding and related impacts over the last several decades, most notably from Hurricane Harvey in 2017. However, as a result of the completion of the first phase of this project, the new Exploration Green Stormwater Park, just prior to the storm, 150 houses in the area around that park that would otherwise have been flooded were protected. When the rest of the project is complete, still ongoing, the project will cover 200 acres that was once a golf course and will include five large detention basins or ponds, along with a large drainage ditch, 
expanding the length of the property to provide extra storage capacity. In total, the park's detention basin will be able to manage 1,680 acres of um, feet of water. The plan for the five-phase park includes recreational facilities, multi-use paths, nature areas, visitor center, and practice fields. The project will also restore several former wetland areas, which will provide another means for managing stormwater quality in the area. The park is expected to be complete in 2022. The project is expected to contribute to managing stormwater for an area of approximately 8,000 acres and will reduce flood risk for approximately 30,000 people who live within a half a mile of this park in addition to multiple businesses and community facilities located in the um, vicinity. Exploration Green has won nine awards since its inception for its innovative use of stormwater management that not only has significantly reduced flood risk to the community, but has also created multiple recreational and societal benefits for the Houston residents. As a um, cost for the project, they're estimating it's going to cost about $38 million. It is um, funded through a variety of sources, including the Clear Lake City Water Authority bonds, Texas Park and Wildlife, multiple private foundations and clubs, the Harris County Flood Control District, and the city of um, Houston. And it's also a great partner project. Um, they've partnered with the city of Houston, of course, the Exploration Green Conservancy, the Galveston Bay Foundation, Trees for Houston, Sea Grant, Texas, out of Texas A&M University, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, and the Texas Coastal Watershed Program. Moving on to our next lifeline. So this one is an example of food, water, and shelter with a tsunami evacuation tower with the Shoalwater Bay um, tribe out of Washington. So the Shoalwater Bay tribe is in the process of construction, constructing this tower, which is designed to serve as a tsunami evacuation structure. The 50-foot high tower will be designed to hold 486 people in the event of a tsunami. The Shoalwater Bay tribe has 70 official members with a total reservation population of 120, which leaves room for some of that surrounding community that they have to um, use the tower as well. The tribe envisions equipping the tower with solar panels in order to communicate during long-term events and stocking the tower with emergency supplies. The tribe received a $2.2 million pre-disaster mitigation or PDM grant from FEMA and is contributing $1 million of its own funds. This will be the second vertical evacuation shelter built on the Washington coast. And when it's complete, the tower will serve um, four times the reservation's population in the event of a tsunami or major flood. This as well has been partnered. The tribe is partnering with the University of Washington and different engineering groups. This one you may have seen in some of our other presentations. Um, but looking at health and medical and looking at hurricane retrofits for critical infrastructure, particularly with the Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami, Florida. So in 2000, a, res a resilience assessment of Nicholas's children's, Nicholas Children's Hospital showed it was highly vulnerable to wind speeds associated with the Category 2 hurricane. The process of retrofitting the hospital to a Category 4 hurricane began soon after and was completed in 2004. In addition to funds that already had set aside, the hospital received additional funding for the project through FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, or HMGP. The hospital is now wrapped in a hurricane-resistant shell, which encases the entire structure in pre-molded panels of, of glass and fiber-reinforced fiber concrete, which are anchored to support the original structure of the building. The retrofits have also include impact-resistant windows and additional roof support. The hospital can now withstand winds up to 200 miles an hour. The retrofits have been already shown to be successful with the past hurricanes that Florida's had. The hospital did not need to evacuate patients or families during Hurricane Francis and Jean in 2004, and were actually able to host evacuees from Florida Keys. During Hurricane Francis, the hospital sheltered over 1,000 patients, employees, and family members. And during, during Hurricanes Katrina and Wilma, the hospital again hosted medical evacuees and families who were displaced during and after the storms.
This is a project I got to tour in 2019. We talk about it a lot, and um, it's one of my favorites as far as um, energy. So looking at uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria's tribe microgrid installation up in Humboldt County, California, in Northern California. So Blue Lake, Lev Blue Lake Rancheria tribe leveraged public-private partnerships to invest in a low-carbon, community-scale microgrid after recognizing the need for resilient infrastructure in a geographically isolated area where power disruptions and outages are frequent. Today, the renewable energy microgrid powers six building campus of the tribe's most critical infrastructure, including government offices, water and wastewater systems, event center, which doubles as a certified American Red Cross emergency shelters in time of need. They had an incredible amount of partnership in their program or in this project, looking at state agencies, the tribe itself, universities, utility, and private sector. And you can see some of those represented on the slide. The total microgrid installation was $6.3 million, finished in 2017. As we move on to communications, um, looking at a project that was doing infrastructure upgrades in Arlington County, Virginia. So Arlington County, Virginia created its own fiber optic network through the Connect Arlington program. Approved by the county board in 2011, the program replaced 52 miles of copper wiring with 60 plus miles of fiber optics to link county facilities, school facilities, and traffic signals. The county also created additional capacity for the, building, for the business community for high-speed secure data transmission through dark fiber. The new network offer, offers transition rates that are at least 100 times faster than previously existing internet access and meets the highest technical standards. The increase, this increased the commu communications resiliency in the county. Before this project was implemented, the county relied on um, radio communications by your tower and microgrid, I'm sorry, microwave for 911 operations. When the storm would hit, it was a potential for signal and service distribution or disruption. The new fiber network cables resolved this. In addition, radio towers can be connected for the highest quality of service in the event of emergency. This allows campuses to provide in-building in public safety radio communication to all buildings from a single source reducing miscommunication and lag time. It's estimated that it had about a $50 million cost in 2014. Um, annual operating expenses are around $700,000 to $800,000. And it was funded both by the county and the Federal Highway Administration. Moving on to transportation, we have an example here from um, Washington with landslide mitigation. So the Washington State Department of Transportation in 2014 did a landslide mitigation action plan that was implemented to address landslides along with Pacific Northwest Rail Corridor. In the past, these landslides have interrupted rail service and created issues of traffic congestion and threatened the safety of passengers and railway employees. The plan laid out mitigation strategies designed to reduce the, incur the current and impacts of landslides along the route. In 2016, BNSF Railway and Washington State DOT completed six federally funded projects at several locations in Washington to stabilize Thorpe slopes and add catchment walls to reduce landslide occurrences and protect the railway. This work included constructing these catchment walls to catch landslide debris before it hit the tracks, um, slide detection fences to give early warning of active landslides, improved drainage systems, and erosion control measures. Since the projects were completed in 2016, no landslides have resulted in these um, locations. Finally, with the seventh um, lifeline, which is hazardous materials, we're going to look at a project that really mitigates against all the lifelines, and that's Newark's rising community, community reconstruction program. It was established in 2012 as a statewide recovery and resiliency initiative that was created to assist communities in the state of New York that were impacted by Superstorm Sandy and the subsequent storm. The program included nearly a thousand projects in different stages of planning and implementation is currently a process of implementing about 300 of those projects throughout the state. 
The projects addressed a broad range of challenges needed to, to related to hurricane or storm recovery and resilience, including um, critical facility infrastructure, economic development, emergency preparedness and recovering, housing, shoreline protection, and other resiliency and recovery-related issues. More than 11,000 homeowners have been assisted with rebuilding or repairs through the program, and between 2012 and 2014, representatives from the program worked with more than 650 local residents and business owners um, at more than 250 different engagements across 124 county or communities across the state of New York. This is extensive post-disaster community engagement identifying hundreds of potential projects for the state of New York can match to a wide range, of, wide range of resiliency grant programs that taken together will mitigate risk across all community lifelines, including hazardous materials. So we hope that today's session has given you more information about what FEMA's community lifelines are how mitigation has been playing a role in them, and give you some example projects to show how specifically mitigation actions against those lifelines. As I've said, this is part four of our five-part um, engagement series that ends next week with brick and nature-based solutions. We'll also be talking about future conditions. You can also see on this slide the link to the YouTube playlist where the past presentations will be loaded. Um, some are already loaded. And of course, don't forget that starting probably around mid-August, um, information coming out soon, we'll be switching over to BRIC and FMA, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, NOFO webinars. Here's a link, list of links. You'll see that um, Community Lifelines link that Ben shared is also here, as well as I'm asking everyone to bookmark the BRIC website, where as we get materials ready, you'll see them come on. I want to thank Kayed and Ben for joining me today to talk about Lifelines. Um, and I'm glad, hope that all of you all found this uh, um, engaging and found this useful. You're going to see some poll questions that have come up. I do ask that you please complete these um, before you sign off. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great day.